Thank you, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I was a student in a string school that was followed by a particle physics school some, uh, I'm ashamed to say, 15 years ago. And uh, when I remember this, um, the discussions about particle physics, what people were excited at the time, that wasn't gravitational waves. I remember Nima being very excited about extra dimensions and what was going to be found at the LHC and so on. So now I'm, what I'm going to tell you about is not about LHC physics, but about gravitational waves. But being this audience, maybe I will try to uh, give you a, a, an idea or a hint about how perhaps we can use gravitational waves to learn about fundamental physics, perhaps about uh, short distance physics in a sense, uh, in a way that we cannot probe with uh, colliders, OK? So now this is a string school, and I was uh, preparing these lectures at a very uh, basic level. And I just saw the great lectures by Ken that were in a, at a level that really even surpassed me significantly. So I will try to keep this as easy as possible. If this is too easy for you guys, you just tell me. And then next time, we'll try to like, uh, upgrade it a notch. Eventually, I want to get to a modern approach, which is what we do, which is trying to solve the two bottom in, in, in problem in gravity to high level of accuracy, which is relevant for gravitational wave data analysis and to learn about the nature of the sources. Um, but if it's uh, too easy, you tell me, and uh, we, we go a little faster. But if it's uh, um, things that you haven't seen before, it might be for you uh, nice to, to go slow and digest. Uh, something which uh, is, a, is a new field or a new subject for you. OK, so please stop me, ask me questions then during the discussions or during this week. You may have lunch with me, and we might discuss and so on. The best part about this school for me was also the discussion among the different lecturers during the breaks and between the two, uh, many of you and, and the students and so on, where I learned a lot that I had no clue about. So take, cherish this moment, because it is a fantastic opportunity. OK, great. So now let's go into the lectures. Um, all right, so by now, you all know about the detection of gravitational waves. That was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, last year uh, to these fellows. Unfortunately, Ronald Trevor died, and he was not awarded. But he was one of the experimentalists, one of the people responsible for building the machine that eventually detected uh, the gravitational waves. Um, I just added this picture here. These are all the women that participated in the LIGO, and you cannot see it very well. Uh, here is Gabby Gonzalez, who was the speak, uh, spoke, uh, spokesperson of the LIGO collaboration during the detection. Then you see also here uh, Alessandro Bonanno, who is the director of the Albert Einstein Institute, where many of the waveforms have been developed analytically and so on. So there is a very large collaboration. There's a lot of people. These three people were awarded, but it's a, it's a, it's a combined effort by uh, thousands of people in the community. So you might think. Uh, also pictures like this that emphasize the type of sources, the type of gravitational wave emitters that we might be able to probe to gravitational wave emission in the different bandwidths. So uh, with different experiments. So we saw like a stellar masses black hole, uh, collisions of stellar mass black holes that were detected by LIGO uh, in, in the like hundreds of hertz and to the kilohertz. And these are the periods. But we might be able to see in the future perhaps uh, with uh, space uh, interferometers such as LISA, which has been uh, commissioned by the European Union, AMESA, uh, we might be able to see uh, extreme mass ratio in spirals. For example, the small masses in spiraling supermassive black holes. The gravitational waves emitted are much lower frequency. And we will see why we cannot see this type of events with uh, ground-based detectors that are sensitive mostly to stellar mass black holes as the ones that were detected uh, by LIGO and also neutron stars, which are also at the uh, highest frequencies. And perhaps even about early universe with pulsar timing arrays, which of course are much uh, longer, uh, uh, much uh, uh, um, uh, longer frequencies, like uh, uh, periods. So for example, we might be able to see phase transitions in the universe. And at much, much lower frequencies, even like to the size of the universe today, we might see gravitational waves produced during the early universe. You might have heard something about this during the last week uh, when you learn about cosmology, uh, this beam polarization in the CMB. This is not direct observation. Obviously, we cannot wait for the period of the age of the universe to see an oscillation of these waves. These things happen in the early universe, left an imprint in the CMB, and it might be seen today through polarization of those photons in the CMB. It's not direct detection, but it also 
is an effect of gravitational waves that happens at very, very low frequencies. So it's indisputable that uh, gravitational waves observations, once we open this range of different frequencies and different sources that we'll be sensitive to, uh, it's indisputable that we have a transformative role of, for astrophysics. So we will start mapping the context of the universe instead of, instead of mass black holes that are out there, neutron stars that we saw also colliding uh, uh, very recently. Uh, maybe how many of the supermassive black holes that might even collide you can have two galaxies colliding in the middle of each galaxy. In the center of each galaxy, you might have a black hole of billions of solar masses. We don't really know how those guys form, but by studying, for example, the gravitational wave produced by the, the spiral of those two black holes in the center of the galaxy, we might learn about the masses and especially the spin, because the spin of those black holes carry a lot of information about the formation mechanism. So you cannot even imagine, like 100 years ago, when Einstein's gravity was developed, that we might be observing the collision of supermassive black holes through the tecton stamp by an interferometer that lives in space millions of kilometers apart or within the Earth around the sun. So this is amazing how much we have gone since the development of general relativity. So the question is, <coughs> what is the impact that these observations might have for um, perhaps fundamental physics, about learning about the nature of black holes. Black holes, I believe, are described by general relativity, but they might have hair. They might have, for example, condensates of particles, like ultralight particles around them that could cause some, sort of, some form of hair. <coughs> we might also want to learn about what is the equation states of neutron stars, do very precise measurements about QCD and their very unique conditions. So all those type of observations that we want to do with gravitational waves might teach us not just about the content of the universe, but perhaps about well, theories that we know, like QCD, but perhaps about new states of matter, like boson stars, or some more complicated gravity stars, or any other thing that is out there that we haven't seen yet. Every time we open a new window in the universe, we might observe the completely unknown. So, <clears throat> This type of picture is just telling you a little bit more about what I just described. There is a lot of experiments, okay? So there is the Virgo, Advanced uh, uh, Virgo, uh, sorry, LIGO, Virgo, Advanced Virgo, Advanced LIGO, and there is the uh, CAGRA, and Einstein's telescope. The CAGRA uh, machine will be a cryogenic and it's frozen in, in, in Japan, so try to isolate the detector from the noise. We're gonna discuss a little bit more about what these cores are. So these are the tip typical sensitivity cores at, at different frequencies. So around here is the LIGO. You see compact binary spirals, how they're gonna look like in the LIGO detector. Don't worry, we'll, we'll come back to this. But this is just to illustrate the, the, the sheer number of experiments, how the, the, the field has exploded after the direct detection by LIGO, all the ground-based detectors, including Einstein's telescope, it, that's gonna be underground, that's gonna have very good sensitivity trying to isolate it from uh, seismic noise, and then we're going to have LISA, and then this, the SIGO, all or the Big Bang Observatory, all these very crazy ideas about doing things in space that might help us uh, beat what is, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, about, about the, the ground-based detectors that have this, this uh, noise problem at the low frequency. And as we move towards low frequency, we are we are increasing the masses of the sources, so we're gonna see the supermassive black hole collisions, and so on and so forth. So it's not just LIGO, there will be a lot of uh, different uh, uh, detectors out there. The, in, in the next maybe 50 years, we will have a plethora of possibility to explore the frequency band of gravitational wave observations with different uh, experiments. And what we are trying to learn, as I was trying to tell you, is, um, precision physics or trying to learn about the nature of those objects, they map the contents of the universe, how many supermassive black holes, how do they form, but maybe to study whether um, there are exotic ob objects in nature, whether we understand the equation of strains of neutron stars and QCD, for example, under unique conditions, where there is hair around black holes, where there are condensates of particles forming boson stars that we haven't seen, and so on and so forth. So I was getting a little bit ahead of myself because what, for, for the, the school, I was trying to put a picture of what I, look at, what I want gravitational wave physics to look like. So I want gravitational wave physics to look a lot like precision physics in high energy. So I want, so we will map the contents of the neural. Astrophysics will be completely redefined after the observation of gravitational waves. 
But to what extent, I'm educated as a particle physicist, and I, and I want to understand the building blocks of nature. To what extent can we make gravitation wave observations uh, to look a little bit like this? And what do I mean to look a little bit like this, in which we do very precise calculations of the so-called standard model to very high level of accuracy that we can then test against the observations and trying to learn about what is out there that is beyond the standard model that you have. For example, if you have general relativity as your standard model, you understand very well the, the solution of general relativity for the binary problem that produces the waves that we will observe. And you have a, 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 an input, some information about, for example, if you have neutron stars, what is the equation state of neutron stars? And by doing very precise measurements of the, of the, of, of, of the um, gravitational waves emitted, you might be able to extract information about the equation states of neutron star, and so on and so forth. So what we do in particle physics, we do very precise uh, calculations, theoretical calculations about different processes, different processes that we will observe in gravitational waves as well with different sources. And we do these calculations to very high level of accuracy, sometimes to next to next to leading order for different observables. Uh, we have systematics, uh, statistical errors, and so on. And we try to see deviations, and what those deviations are, and whether they hint about something new. I, I, I put this here just to, to, to lead the field, perhaps, of gravitational waves for more uh, fundamental physics, or, or for more particle physics-oriented audience, into how we can try to, to um, walk towards Something like this, in including gravitational waves observations as a new window to the universe. And what am I doing all this, blah, blah, blah? Because the LHC hasn't seen anything. So perhaps gravitational waves is one of the few ways, or cosmology, perhaps looking at the sky, is the only way in which we can learn about the building blocks of nature beyond what we know uh, today. Okay? And what we do, for example, in particle physics, when we do effective field theory, or we do field theory, and then we see what's beyond, is we have bounds on the cutoff scale of the new physics with high dimensional operators, right? Famously, you have this S and T parameter, so you have the Lagrangian of the standard model, and then you include <coughs> high dimensional corrections, you see the deviations and you put bounds on those uh, uh, parameters. So we will see that we can try to do maybe something like this as well. We won't try to see deviations of general relativity necessarily, but these parameters would encode the short distance physics of the object that is producing the gravitational waves. For example, in the case of neutron stars, what is the equation of state of the neutron star? And that information will be encoded in some parameters because at the scale of the gravitational wave emission, which is what we look at, those parameters uh, or, or, or the effect of those parameters of the short distance physics on the long distance effect of the gravitational wave emission will so-called decouple, and therefore it will go into some sort of high dimensional operator in the jargon of particle physics, and there will be one coefficient that will give you that information about the inner structure of the bodies. And by matching those coefficients with expectations about what the black hole uh, coefficients will look like, for example, what are the finite size effects for black holes or the equation state of neutron star, we might be able to learn about what's happening with the nature of those objects, the characteristics of the objects that are producing the gravitational waves. Okay? So that's what we walk into. And this is where we are right now. Is there gravitational wave precision data right now? Well, we just started, we just have, have a handful of events that are described here. I don't remember if this has all the events already, but there are about six binary black holes. And the one that I'm isolating here uh, is the case of the neutron stars, which is, these are the, the masses, the mass of, of well, you, you, you always divide, one is the heavier. It doesn't really matter which one, and one and two. So these are the masses, and we see these are of the order of, of uh, 10 to 30 solar mass black holes that we have detected. We haven't seen this type of, of uh, black holes before, so now we saw them through um, gravitational wave observation. So that was already uh, something new. People, some people expected, some people did not expect it to see black holes this heavy. So through X-ray observations, we hadn't seen this, this uh, type of black holes before. So now we detect this uh, black holes of maybe of the order of 30 solar masses, but we, we see that the errors are large. So the, the, this is also, as we will see, this is also because the, the LIGO detector is not yet working at the science sensitivity. The number of, of cycles that we observed within the band wasn't very long, so we couldn't do much statistic with them to reduce the errors. So we see very large errors on the masses and so on. The errors here are smaller because the, the, the neutron star has a, a smaller mass. Um, 
But uh, this will improve as we get more and more data, as we get uh, uh, better sensitivity and we get longer uh, waveforms. The longer the waveform, the more cycles, the more cycles you can improve the, uh, on the error. Naively, one over the number of cycles give an error on the parameters, but you have to see how to break the genesis because the parameters that we will see enter in the computation of the gravitational waves will not be directly M1 and M2. It will be this so-called shear mass. So we might be able to get the shear mass very well, but then you need to break the degeneracies into M1 and M2. But what about if these, guys are, if these guys are spinning? So you have to start to understand how does the spin of the black holes or the neutron stars alter the waveform such that you might extract the information about the spin and the masses um, very accurately. Well, it turns out that uh, there is some common uh, lore about what was needed to get some basic parameter estimation out of the waveforms. And this is what I will try to uh, do during, during this lecture. Um, but the present template bank might be sufficient for this uh, crude parameter estimation, but it might not be sufficient to address questions like, what is, for example, the equation state of a neutron star, right? This is, this is a 10 kilometer uh, solar mass object that is held by some quantum pressure. I don't know if you ever uh, thought about it, but the, the, the reason neutron stars exist is just uh, amazing. And the fact that we saw the collision of two like uh, astrophysical quantum states of around 10 kilometers with solar mass uh, black holes uh, uh, in mass producing these gravitational waves detected by, uh, by LIGO is just as, uh, probably as, as good as it gets. Um, so to get the equation of state of the neutron star, the, the present template bank might be too coarse, might not be sufficient to really distinguish between different uh, possibilities for the phase diagram of QCD or how compact or how big the stars can get and so on. So there is a lot of real solid physics to be learned from a gravitational wave observation, not only like trying to map new exotic objects like boson stars and so on. But to get to measure this, uh, this equation state of the neutron star or to decouple the effects of the short phys distant physics on the size of the object, on the long wavelength physics, which is the gravitational wave that we observe and they propagate to us in the detector, uh, we need to understand at which order those effects enter. And right now, the, the, the effects of the, of the equation state of neutron star is parameterized in terms of this parameter, uh, lambda, which is like what is called the tidal deformability. And we will see what it is. This is I'm just giving you like some big rough idea of what, where this is going. But there will be all these parameters, like the masses, the spin, and some extra parameters that encode information about the nature of the object. One of those parameters is the tidal deformability. And there was a bound that was given uh, um, uh, by, by the LIGO collaboration when they saw the collision of binary in neutron star. So you don't know what this bound means yet. I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more. But it's, it's somewhat poor. It's not, it's not very good to distinguish yet about um, uh, the different uh, possibilities for the equation of state of neutron star. And it's also very poor if you, instead of it translated, instead of neutron star, you were thinking about understanding uh, the possibility of hairs around the black holes or the possibility of more exotic objects that could have different tidal parameters that could be also extracted to gravitational wave uh, observations. And the reason is because this effect is very small. It enters a very high order. And we are not yet at, that, at the order, at the level of accuracy that is, is comparable to the size of this effect. It's like if you have a high dimensional operator in your theory and you scale with some power of the energy over some cutoff, you want to have very precise control of the standard model to the order of the error of that high dimensional operator. And we are not yet at that uh, level of accuracy. And, and moreover, if you're thinking about the future, about what Lisa will be able to accomplish, the signal to noise ratio, which means how sensitive, how well Lisa is going to be able to detect certain sources. Is, is, is extremely good. It's much, much better than LIGO. And therefore, even if you don't believe that there is nothing exotic, even if you don't believe that you can go beyond some rough estimate about the equation of state of neutron stars and so on, just to beat the experimental error, we need to go to higher order of precision. So right now, for uh, um, the empirical reach of future detectors, we are dominated by theoretical error. And this is also what happened with LHC. The LHC was getting better and better, and then people started doing more and more precise calculations to get that theoretical error down to compete with experimental error in order to see 
what it's out there in order to also to map correctly to do the best parameter estimation in the case of gravitational waves, but also to get to the level of dominated by experiment and not dominated by theory, right? Okay, so let me just recap what I say. What I think is the, is the future of uh, uh, gravitational wave science from the point of view of perhaps more uh, fundamental physics, from the point of view of uh, particle physicists, someone that was more educated in the particle physics uh, community. Of course, you might say, well, we map these black holes, there are about 30 solar masses, we start getting a, a number of events, we start getting a rough idea about the spins. Uh, I went too quickly, actually, nobody asked me. Uh, so this is a rough uh, bound uh, of this event, I believe, that was about 20 solar mass, about what was the spin of the black holes. And we got some indication that there was some spin maybe bigger than around 0.2, in, and it was like anti line with angular momentum. The other guy, we really had no idea, okay? So even mapping the spin very accurately will require precise theoretical control over the waveforms because of all the degeneracies that are uh, involved in, in the computation of the waveforms and extracting that information uh, from the data. And this, the, the spin in particular, from the astrophysical point of view, is essential because we don't really know much about how these black holes form. Astrophysically speaking, they have some ideas about, so you, form, you have a star, and then uh, the, the star starts accreting, and then it forms a black hole and explodes, and then there is another star that accrete all this mass that is left over, and then eventually forms a black hole. There's this common envelope uh, formalism. When you do that, you generate large torques, and those torques spin the black hole very rapidly and they tend to align it with the angular momentum. So rapid rotation and, and align with the angular momentum will be an indication that something like this might have happened, but this is not what we start to see. Now, does this disprove it? Well, we still don't know because we don't really measure the spin uh, uh, very well yet. So for this, you need um, higher precision. So even if you think that astrophysically, just as, for example, all, also another thing, um, by the time that you see these guys in the LIGO band, They've been going around for millions of years. And we see the very, very last whisper, okay? As you will see, it lasts for fractions of a second. By the time they get there, the orbit has circularized. Most of the, of the eccentricity of the orbit is radiated away. And by the time the guy gets there and it's circular, we can do very, or, or try to simplify our cal calculations about solving for the binary problem on a circular orbit. But in LISA, we might be able to see earlier uh, early on in the evolution of the, of, the, of the binary, and you might also be able to see this extreme mass ratio case in which you might have a small guy coming in an eccentric orbit, okay? And it turns out that some of those eccentric orbits, if you really want to track the waveform extremely well, you will need to get to very high level of precision. So from the point of view of just astrophysics, getting the waveform very accurately is very, very important to learn about the formation mechanisms of many astrophysical uh, objects. I just want to emphasize that there's a lot of beautiful astrophysics to be done with gravitational waves and precision measurements. But since you are string theorists, um, if you want to learn perhaps about more fundamental physics, about short distance physics or, or, or solid QCD physics but on scales, uh, densities and pressures that we haven't proved yet, we need to go to a level of precision that we have not achieved yet. Okay, so I'm telling you all this because there is a lot to do yet, and we might not know how to get to the level of precision that is required, as you will see, these calculations are very hard, to be able to extract this information very precisely. And why I'm saying this also to a string uh, theory audience is because some techniques that have been developed very recently about scattering amplitudes that also came out of ideas of duality, something called like double copy and so on, might simplify calculations and general relativity using gauge theory ideas. So there might be something for you guys to do and help us get to this uh, level of precision that I'll show you will be required to learn a lot about maybe more fundamental physics, not just astrophysics, but more uh, fundamental, well, astrophysics is also fundamental. I don't wanna uh, yeah, downplay anybody, okay? But uh, since it is a string theory school, I can say fundamental more lightly. Um, so, a strong interactive matter and the unique condition. This is already just the best you can possibly get. Neutron stars are the most amazing objects in nature, okay? And the collision of neutron stars forming black holes, probably there is nothing that can beat that, okay? So just getting this and trying to instead of a neutron star is already uh, um, a fascinating, fascinating uh, enterprise. But 
what about black holes and exotics? We have hair, we have boson stars, we have cosmic string, all the things that I was trying to emphasize before. Um, what about clouds? What about black holes that can have condensates of um, ultralight particles? If you have particles whose constant wavelength is bigger than the stellar mass black holes, so masses of around 10 to the minus 10 to the 10 to the minus 20 electron volts that now are very popular for dark matter candidates. Uh, well, not on, 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 on the scale of stellar mass, not 10 to the minus 20, but 10 to the, not 10 to the minus 10, but maybe 10 to the minus 20, this idea of facet dark matter, maybe dark matter is like some condensate of very light particles. String theory gives you these axivars, these action light particles, many, many, many of them, some of which could be around the 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 20. Uh, ballpark. Those guys might be excited through super radiant stabilities around highly rotated black holes, and they will form hair. It eventually will decay away, as, as we expect from Norhart theorems, but if they last long enough, astrophysically speaking, they will leave an imprint in the waveforms. So we might be able to use this as some kind of collider physics as well, meaning oh, the black holes will form this hair, this hair will leave an imprint in the gravitational waveforms and eventually decay. Can we extract that information too? from gravitational wave observations? And, and yes, the answer is yes. And all these exotics, boson stars, the completely unknown that we still don't know, that will tell us how do we distinguish a black hole from something completely different, will be extracted from gravitational wave observation if we get to very high level of precision. So I'm, I'm trying to sell you precision gravity to learn about fundamental physics. And at what order? Well, we need to go to fifth order beyond the Newtonian level. This, yes, question, awesome, yes. You didn't define anything. Nothing, I haven't defined anything at all. This will come out uh, very soon. And I, I, I noticed that I talk a lot and I haven't written a single equation. Um, so I haven't defined x at all. This is the, uh, uh, an expansion parameter. And I just want to mention this is the fifth order beyond Newton. And this x is like a post-Newtonian parameter. x is v squared in the binary problem. So this is v to the 10. This is five orders, five post-Newtonian orders beyond the Newtonian approximation is the order at which we see many effects associated with what we call finite size. So from the point of view of field theory or effective field theory, if you want, or from the point of view of what we do in, in, in the standard model, the, these S and T parameters, at which order the S and T parameter enters and contribute to a process, is if you understand the, the, the waveform associated with the uh, general relativity standard model, up to fifth order beyond the, the, the Newtonian, the quadruple formula. That's the order at which we want to get. And I'm going to walk you through it. There, we're going to derive this formula. We're going to try to see how we get this guys, what this means, and so on and so forth. This will be my goal. This is the colloquial style I'm motivating why this is nice, OK? And this is a completely uncharted territory. We might not only map the number of black holes and how many black holes we have out there. We might even discover something completely new. OK, very good. So that's, that's, that's the plan of this lecture. So the plan of this lecture is, uh, I don't have much time, um, to tell a little bit about LIGO, about waveforms. We're going to do now calculations about how we compute that, that equation that I wrote there, which is the change on the orbital frequency in time of the binary in spiral. That change of the orbital frequency will be associated with the uh, gravitational wave frequency. The gravitational wave frequency of the phase of the gravitational wave is what's going to be picked up by LIGO, and therefore by precise measurements of how the frequency is changing with time. Uh, the waveform that will tell us how that looks like is that we're going to get those parameters that I told you before, including, crucially, this tidal deformability that will carry a lot of information about the structure of the bodies. It's the only effect that knows whether you have a neutron star of a black hole or than the mass. If you have something which is 100 solar masses, obviously it's not a neutron star, but you still don't know whether you saw a black hole or something that looks a lot like a black hole, but not necessarily is what we expect uh, from isolated black holes in, in nature. Okay, so precision gravity, this is what I think is the future of gravitational wave science from the point of view of extracting information about the sources. So I will tell you a little bit more about how these coefficients come about, how we're gonna try to get that uh, from uh, the waveforms that are observed um, for, for, uh, as we do the data analysis, as we try to get the, the, the best waveform that matches the data. And the key for you guys will be how do we get to this level of precision because the tools that we have right now, 
the level of precision that we have, the, the template bank that we have right now to try to extract the best information that we can about the sources is not accurate enough. And to get to the level of precision required, might need new tools. Okay, I will tell you how we do the calculations, and then you will see that they get very complicated, and at some point we might get stuck, and we want to go further, we might need to redefine the way we do these calculations in general relativity. Okay, very good. So very quickly, about uh, uh, what I just told you about a new window of the universe, about the LIGO uh, uh, detector. The LIGO is an interferometer that detects uh, the, the, the change in the arm length through changes in the, in the power. So basically it's set up such that light goes back and forth and then it is it, constructed or destructed. You can tune it to be destructed such that eventually, eventually they are on top of each other. So the wavelengths are uh, exactly the number of the, of the length. So basically this four kilometer uh, arms are exactly at four kilometers when there is no gravitational waves. So the gravitational wave it comes, the proper distance changes associated with the gravitational wave that is coming. It's a time-dependent effect. Obviously, if you have a static, a completely static effect, you might be able to gauge it away. So the gravitational wave comes. It causes oscillations in the changes in distance. And those oscillations and changes in distance are seen by the interferometer, seeing the changes of power or the, or the changes in phase that are seen by the detector um, as the gravitational wave transits uh, through the detector. Uh, okay, so here is when I was uh, started to do, uh, I, I will start uh, using more uh, uh, the ball. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this sort of equation, so I was planning also to give you um, a brief introduction. I see that I might need to um, pick up the, the pace a little bit. I was planning on giving you a little bit more introduction about how these equations come about, which are the equations that tell you how the length is going to change with time and how this is associated to the gravitational wave strength that is coming uh, to the detector. And this is eventually what we want to see as a gravitational wave phase, as we want to see as uh, uh, our um, observation that we want to match into some waveform that we're going to construct uh, theoretically. Okay? So what I want to tell you now is, uh, is uh, essentially where uh, this equation comes from. Uh, how many of you have seen this equation? So maybe I can, I can just, can you raise your hand if you've seen this equation before? Can you raise it higher? Okay, so it's about half of the other people are not paying attention. So those are the two options. Okay, so let me just very briefly then uh, derive this equation. So this equation is the essence of what this uh, uh, gravitational wave observation is about. Essentially, you want what is gravity? Gravity is a theory of geometry. So it comes, a gravitational wave comes. There is a time-dependent oscillation. It comes and it makes an oscillation, change in the, in the proper distance of the, on the arms. And this is picked by the interferometer, the same way that, that, that Mike Kesson and Molly were trying to see the time, the, 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 whether the, the, the speed of light changed when you had the, the motion of the Earth uh, in the ether and so on. So this is a very basic idea in interferometry. Uh, how this is going to be uh, mapped into a change in the length and we were trying to extract this uh, waveform. So where is this equation uh, coming from? So this equation essentially comes from, and this breaks. So this equation comes from, um, from the judaistic equation. So if you go to a rest frame, in the rest frame of the detector, so this is, there are many ways in which this equation is derived. And this TT stands for transfer traceless, which is a gauge. We need to, we're gonna have a physical observable, but to get physical observables, as in electrodynamics, you might have to fix a gauge. Gravity uh, uh, around flat space, as you know, it has a gauge symmetry. Um, and therefore, we need to fix a gauge the same way that you do with the Coulomb or Lorentz gauge and so on. This is what TT stands for. And often, you will see this equation derived in many different ways. The easiest way to think about what's going on is to have the detector in a free falling frame. And so there is a perturbation, which is a curvature perturbation, which is often what captures the physics. If you're in a free falling flame, you know you're in flat space. The, the connection vanishes, so the first derivative you can kill. And the physical information about whether you have any, any, um, uh, any uh, sources producing changes in the geometry is in the curvature, right? And this you can see, for example, about the length of the arms or how they are changing. If you have a difference between the length, between the distance, if this is sourced by curvature, just by looking at the geodesic equation. 
uh, the uh, geodesic deviation equation that will tell you if you have a gravitational wave, how the gravitational wave is going to perturb uh, the space time. Okay, so the connections are zero, so this is all the information that you need. This, this will be the geodesic deviation equation, but the connections are zero, so all the information is in the second derivative of the metric. If you, I'm not sure how much in, in the cosmology uh, courses uh, 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 Guillaume was able to tell you, but this is also a, 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 a lot of the physics that we learn about in the universe when we do calculations. It's also associated to try to understand how most of the physics is associated with two derivatives, how things scale with momentum. In the early universe, you see a bunch of k squares, like two derivatives of momentum, and basically this is the same. So, for example, I don't know if, if he talked about squeeze limits and so on. So, what captures this, the essence of the physics is two derivatives of the metric, no one derivative of, of, uh, of the metric. Uh, very good. So, the key is that in something called the TT gauge, well, S is like the L that will point in the, the four kilometers. It's a vector, yeah, exactly. Because that's the distance. So think about the mirror to be uh, a suspended, free falling, right? And this is um, this, uh, the, the beam splitter that split the beam in two directions, right? This is like stuck in there, much bigger mass, right? And then the other, that distance will oscillate, and this distance will oscillate as the wave comes. Um, okay, and the TT gauge uh, that will, uh, so basically, we are perturbing around flat space. And we're looking how the effect of the gravitational wave will change the distances between the arms. And there's a TT gauge. Which is defined in this way. So it's transfer traceless. I'm left-handed, so I tend to walk as a talk and cover the board. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking, as I said, I hope you can read. So there are no temporal components. It's transverse and it's traceless. And you may be familiar when you derive the Einstein equations in the weak field limit. You may be familiar with the so-called Lorentz condition. So the Lorentz condition in something called the, the, the uh, reverse trace field, which after you write Einstein's equations in the weak field limit, you get some complicated expression of two derivatives of the metric times the source, which is T mu. It is convenient to choose a gauge, and this gauge often uh, is, is done with something called the, the trace reverse uh, field. But in the TTT gauge, because we're gonna go to trace free and we don't have zero component, this will be essentially uh, the same as the Lorentz condition in, in the H field. So this will fix our gauge. Essentially, as you remember, as you might have seen, there is box H equal T mu. Usually when you get these equations out of um, the weak gravity approximation, when you have a source, Right? If, uh, and then you choose, you, you, you choose, for example, the Lorentz gauge. If you are in vacuum, then you have extra freedom because you can always do a coordinate transformation that has a Laplace and equal to zero. Uh, that extra freedom will allow you to choose these other conditions. You have more, usually the Laplace of the, of the psi field, that, so you have the coordinate transformations that you can do, as you know. So this is a gate, uh, a gate freedom that you have that transforms the metric accordingly. If you're in vacuum, this does not feel, uh, fixes the gauge completely because you still have redundancy. Box of phi equals zero will still uh, be allowed as gauge transformation, and then you can essentially propagate it in vacuum. You can fix the TT gauge by imposing these two conditions, okay? So in this case, this is not very elaborate. It's just weak field general relativity in vacuum that has a, a, an invariance that you can fix. And in vacuum where there is no source, you have extra invariance that you can allow you to fix uh, uh, 
these two conditions. In fact, you have four here, you have five here. There's one which is redundant with this one, and therefore you can uniquely fix the gauge this way. Then you look at the judicic deviation equation that will tell you how the distances are changing with time. As you have a gravitational wave that produces a curvature in the free falling frame, I'm doing the, all this in the frame in which I'm just looking at uh, uh, the two derivative departures from flat space. The connection is zero, so I didn't write here the covariant derivative, and the metric is flat to, to first approximation. Okay? So there is how this R I zero J zero is equal or approximate. Um, I'm using com this, this guy, let's put it down. I use uh, this guy is one minus one minus one minus one. And this is double dot in this cage. So I didn't do anything extremely elaborate. If I do this cage, when you span the Riemann tensor, what happens is that you have the R mu nu alpha beta, it has H mu alpha nu beta, comma nu beta and then all the permutations. And then you go ahead and evaluate that in this case. So you've seen, you've seen, you know who this guy is in terms of derivatives of the connections and two connections. You expand it in the weak field limit, right? The connection vanishes, so the only thing that matters here is the derivatives of the connection. So you have two derivatives of the metric, okay? And then you just look at that Riemann tensor with two derivatives of the metric, you impose this case, and it turns out that when you look at this guy, because here, uh, since I'm in the free falling frame, the, there is a U0, U0, which is one. I look at this component, and then I get this. And this will be the equation that tells us how the, the, the length is changing, the proper length is changing, the proper length is changing with time as the gravitational wave uh, passes through the detector. Now, why I'm emphasizing all this at the free falling frame that I'm in the proper uh, uh, distances and so on? Because sometimes you see this equation derived differently. And you see it the, the derived differently because if you look at the TT gauge, what does it do to the coordinates? It moves with the wave. So if you look at the geodesic equation, do this as an exercise. What, if you look at the, the, the geodesic equation or how does each point moves, just one point, not the judicic deviation equation, but the judicic equation of, of, of the mirror, for example. How does it move? So you write the judicic equation, and then you see that the connection vanishes in the TT gauge, and therefore the, the, the coordinates essentially don't move. What does it mean that the coordinates don't move? Well, it doesn't mean that nothing is happening. It just means that it's deforming with the wave. The grid is deforming with the wave. But the proper distances are changing. So when you go ahead and compute the proper distance, which is the square root of the length, and you expand this, now you see the h popping out. And when you expand the square root, is how you get this factor of a half, and how you get that equation, okay? So this is the magic of GR, in which case you're doing it, at the end of the day, you get the same uh, physical information, okay? So I guess um, most of you have or have not seen this. this is, uh, uh, how the, the change in time of the length is gonna be as the gravitational wave uh, enters uh, the detector. Okay, so what is the typical, and okay, and from here, we get this equation that tells us how the gravitational wave is gonna come, it's gonna affect the length. And from here, if we write the length as some four kilometers plus some change, S is the distance. Okay, somebody should have asked me right away uh, 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 one key question here. Um, so in principle, I'm using this judicic deviation equation, but in principle, it could be higher derivatives. So what controls here that I just stop here with two derivatives of the metric? Right, because what you do to get the geodesic equation is that you go to a geodesic one point, the geodesic nearby, right? And the geodesic nearby will depend on the metric field at some point which is displaced, 
and then you take derivatives. The first derivative vanishes because the connection is zero. The second derivative gives you the Riemann tensor, right? But in principle, it could be higher derivatives. So there is some derivative expansion here, which is associated with the wavelength of the, of the uh, gravitational wave, or the frequency, if you want, with the length, which is this four kilometers. So for this to be truncated, with just two derivatives, we need that the wavelength of the gravitational waves may be longer, or the curvature, the curvature length of the space-time, which is one over the uh, wavelength square, be longer than the separation. So here we require that the length of the detector, which is or L0 if you want, this is our four kilometers, over the wavelength uh, squared, because this is the two derivatives that are going to come here. The two derivatives are controlled by derivatives of the metric. That's controlled by the wavelength. And this is controlled by S. But this is much less than 1. And this is going to be the case. So the typical wavelength for us, it will be around 2 to the 3, two, Two to the two, two to the uh, three kilometers. So these are long wavelengths, and we'll see how this is associated with the type of experiment that LIGO is sensitive because of the frequency band. We will see the frequency band, which is about ten hertz and a kilohertz. You can convert that to the typical uh, uh, wavelength and the typical wavelength of the waves that are going to be produced within the LIGO sensitivity, which is about stellar mass uh, black holes. And you can roughly think about the typical frequency as one over the mass. One over the typical mass will give you an idea of the typical frequency. In the frequency band of LIGO, you will see that you're essentially sensitive to stellar mass, stellar mass black holes between one and 100 solar masses. And the wavelengths are of the order of 100,000 kilometers. The arms are about four kilometers. You can just show that this is uh, very small. Okay? So if we look at the judicic deviation equation from a wave that comes, that has a long uh, uh, wavelength, we look at the judicic deviation equation, we fix our gauge to know what in the free falling frame the change will be associated to a change in the arm's length. And then we solve this equation, so we see that the change will be. A, this is a small correction, so you keep first order in delta L, and it, it will be two derivatives of this guy here times two derivatives of this guy. This is L0, which is the fixed amount, which is looking at the oscillations in the change on the four kilometer, and then you get the delta I equal or similar. Uh, TT. Uh, I am right now time, right? Or I stayed, how much time I have? Ten minutes, oh, ten minutes, okay, ten minutes is not so bad. Uh, I was planning, I was giving lectures of an hour and a half. I realized that an hour is much less than an hour and a half. Uh, please ask me questions later. I'll be super happy to go through this individually, okay? I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna get to half of what I would like to tell you, okay? So, but I'm, I, I, as you see, I talk a lot, so if you come and talk to me, I'll reply, okay? All right, so this is the key equation, right? That will tell us how the, the changes in the arm in time. And what are we sensitive to? We are sensitive to variations in the arm's length of the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters. What does that mean? Well, look, let's compare with things that we know. What do we know? We know that a human hair is about 100 microns. We know that the atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. We know that the nuclear, it's a Fermi, is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So what is 10 to the minus 18? It's maybe a hundreds of, uh, like a thousandth of the size of a proton, right? So this is what they, these guys are trying to measure as variations in length of the, of the arms of the LIGO interferometer. Now, how do you do that? Do you go on and put a, a, a rod and try to measure this? I mean, the rod is made of atoms, 
right? How are you going to get with a rod to measure a variation which is less than maybe an atom or a proton inside the rod, okay? So that, that would be a static measurement. That would be trying to put this on top of the, uh, of the uh, interferometer. So that's not how it's done. So how it's done is by Bismar, and we should have given a Nobel Prize to Mr. Fourier, because we are going to Fourier transform this and look in frequency space, and we're going to look for things that are changing in time, and they're changing in time at different frequencies. And we're going to be sensitive to very specific values of very specific frequencies in which you might be able to see through the power in the photo detector variations which are comparable to variations in the arm length of the order of 10 to the minus 80 meters in those frequency bands, okay? Why am I, this is the, did I lose the thing? No. This is the LIGO band. So this equation that gave us this, uh, here are the two type of polarization that I, I didn't tell you. So after uh, you fix the gauge and you get the TT gauge, if you go to the XY plane in which you put the, your detector and you move it in the C direction, right? So this condition essentially tells you that you don't have C components, you still have X and Y components, and it's symmetric trace free. So you get XX and XY, and those are the two ways in which you can uh, um, essentially have these changes in time of the length. It will stretch or contract the, the XX, YY component, so you can have the XX, so the HIJ, you have the H plus or the H cross. So it comes, as it's trace free, that's what the minus does. And this is key, this minus. Why? Because what it does is the way it comes in the C direction and it starts like stretching in one direction and contracting in the other direction, which is this pattern, okay? And that's, that's just this equation. And the other one is transverse. It's the X polarization, which is here. And this is essentially the change that I was just telling you from this equation. So we transform in Fourier space and we are sensitive in some frequency band to changes in this distance. Why is crucial that we are in a, sensitive, in, in a frequency? Because obviously, on much lower frequencies, uh, they are st static from the point of view, maybe 100 hertz. Lower frequencies, it will be more like a static type uh, perturbations, which are way bigger than the 10 to the minus 80, 80 meter. And this is what is called the seismic wall. So there are changes in the gradients of the gravitational potential which are of the order of 10 to the nine, 10 to the minus nine, which is much bigger than the 10 to the minus 20, which LIGO is sensitive to minus 23, 22, 21. This is the strength. This is the ages that we are sensitive uh, to, which you multiply by the four kilometers and you get the 10 to the minus 18 meters. Okay, so there are much, much bigger uh, sources of noise at low frequency that you need to isolate. So you need to go to, a, this, this spikes uh, the, the mirror, is standing there and it has a, a normal mode. And some of those frequencies are those uh, spikes. But you want to live somewhere here in frequency to see the effects of the gravitational wave much higher than this seismic wall, this 10 to the minus nine perturbations in the potential at low frequencies that basically do not, that completely swamp the effects on, in frequency of the gravitational wave. Now at, at about a kilohertz, which is uh, uh, the, the other end of the LIGO band, then you have the, what's called the shot noise. So then you have the photons, the radiation pressure. If you put too much energy in the laser at a higher frequency, then you start banging on the mirrors. And the banging on the mirrors moves the mirror and then changes the distance, so you have some noise from there. You have to balance also from the fact that you're measuring the power and how many photons you're gonna have in the cavity. So you wanna have enough photons also to have a good distribution to get the, 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 the power, to get the timing right. So you have a balance between the number of photons and the radiation pressure. And this is also uh, this, uh, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just quoting things that I hear when I ask the people why this is hard. And this is the reason why it's hard. At the kilohertz. So this is where the, all this quantumness comes about, about thinking about the photon banging on the mirror 
And because it's quantum and for frequency and energy, as you know, the more frequency, the more energy, the more it bangs. Okay? So there is a sweet spot somewhere in between in which we're going to be sensitive to something which is not seismic, which is not this uh, quantum pressure, and it might be a gravitational wave. Okay? Basically trying to observe this effect on the order of ages, okay, which are 10 to the minus 21, 20 to the minus 22, that produces in four kilometers changes in the arm of about uh, 10 to the minus 18 meters on four, four kilometer arms. Okay? And this was done. So my plan was to tell you about all about this figure, so I might have to do it next time. Um, I promise I'll go faster and on the board next time. Um, so this was done, meaning uh, this is the strain, the amplitude of the strain, this H that was observed by the LIGO detector. So they saw a wave, and this is the signal in Hanford, this is the signal in Livingstone. There a little, the, 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 the detector, I don't have a picture, the detectors are not exactly aligned with each other, so you have to rotate it. And, the, and there are, um, there's time of propagation that also gives information about in which direction the wave is coming. Because it, it, it's, a wave for, it's a wave front that comes, you have the two detectors, there's a wave front that comes, and it eventually will hit the other guy. But it doesn't hit on, and they are not oriented exactly because of also the earth curvature and so on. So you need, it's not that they, they, they look exactly the same on top of each other. You need to do some transformation to take one into another, and, and once you superpose, and at least you notice that it was the same wave. It took about seven milliseconds to get from one to the other. That is also consistent with this propagator and the speed of light. And by looking in when this guy gets the wave that is oscillating perpendicular to the propagation, right? is that we might have an idea of where it came from. Unfortunately, it's not much of an idea with just these two detectors, but with a third detector, you may actually get better. And that's what Virgo did, which is try to triangulate and see where the uh, wave came from, okay? But what I want to get out of, uh, out of here is that there was some oscillation. They saw some, some wave in the frequency band of LIGO. So we will see here the frequency went of around 40 hertz to around 300 hertz, which is around here where they started entering and then whoop, emerged somewhere here at around 10 to the minus 21 in strength. And this is the reconstructed uh, wave, and that is what we, uh, I was trying to uh, do and I might have to do next time. It's about how do we construct this, which is the model, to try to map it into what uh, was observed, which is these oscillations. This is the data, this is the model. There is some reconstruction of the model. There is also these gray bands that try to reconstruct the basically superpo superposing waves once you subtract the noise and try to get this um, what is called reconstructed wavelets. It's just sines and cosines trying to get the wave. And then in this case, it was just a numerical relativity because it's just a few cycles. Numerical relativity can do just a few cycles in a few months. And therefore, they can just produce enough uh, waveforms of solving for binary black holes of a given mass. And we will see that some rough estimate, if you go and do some Fermi analysis of this picture, which is what I wanted to do today, you can get almost everything. And then you do that, and then you inform the numerical friends what are the masses that you expect to have. They run a lot of simulations, and lo and behold, wow, it was right on top of it. So that gives us very strong evidence, uh, confidence that we detected a gravitational wave, not only that it was something that resembled black holes, at least, to very good approximation. And I'll tell you why we're not sure yet. Um, and uh, it's consistent with general relativity. And this is how it looked like in the detector at some given frequency. The frequency starts going up. You see this here too. The frequency starts going up, whoop, emerges, and then eventually it settles, emerges, it emerges, it rings a little, it settles extremely quickly. All this happens in fractions of a second, 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4. Emerges, it rings a little, and then it goes off. It's stationary and produces some final curve black hole. And from these pictures, and from the waveforms, we're trying to extract the parameters, giving some bias about what you think was out there. Right? In this case, binary black holes over 30 solar mass, um, like 62 solar mass, 65 solar mass black holes, and they emitted about three solar mass in energy. So my idea next time will be to start here. I will do some basic, very simple uh, calculations in general relativity to see how we go from here 
to here, not, not numerical GR, but analytic, and then we'll see how we got to improve and what we need to go further once we see longer wavelengths. Because this one is very short, you can do it numerically, very long wavelengths, which means waves that will last for longer times in the detector. That will require also that the masses may be a little bit lower for the LIGO uh, experiment. How are we gonna go from the theory to the data? Okay, this is just a numerical waveform. It didn't uh, do much from the point of view of analytics, but we'll see that analytics are gonna be crucial to be able to get the parameters, especially for what we call the spiral phase, which is when those guys are still not merging far apart and going many, 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 many times around before they merge. And we might get to see all this within the detector band and we need to uh, model it. Now, uh, okay, I'll do, it, I'll do it next time. This just tell you they succeeded. There's a beautiful new window that has opened that we, we, we will learn a lot about uh, astrophysics, about fundamental physics, and perhaps about uh, uh, completely exotic new objects that we haven't seen yet, and um, to be able to extract the most information from the data, we need to get, get, have very precise templates, and this is what I will, I will do for you, and I will pick up the pace next time. Uh, so let me stop here, thank you very much. <laughs>